Hello, everyone. Oops, too early. <laughs> oh my God. People are going to see me like just talking and just be like, what the heck? <laughs> you'll see. You guys will see. When you see it in like 12 seconds, you guys, you'll be like, what the? <laughs> anyway. Um, oh, yeah, hello. there you are. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I started like way too early. Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome <clears throat> to the part two of the Queen Mary arrives. Um, <clears throat> let me go ahead and get this thing off of the screen. There we go. Uh, so in the last, uh, well, first of all, let me just reintroduce my co-hosts. So we have here Steve Ablonsi. So he's a good friend of mine and historian of the Queen Mary, in my own words. I know he probably wouldn't say that himself, but say hello, Steve. Hey, hello, everybody. <laughs> and I have here my other friend Shiloh from Henry Hall Fan. So say hello, Shiloh. Hello, everyone. Shiloh is, uh, well, first of all, a lover of really great music, um, particularly 40s, 30s, 20s band music, um, and uh, and also is a, a good researcher of the Queen Mary. And then Steve is uh, the host of the Blue Ribboned channel. So, yeah, their links are in the description below if you guys want to um, to see their channels and stuff. So anyway, but we, uh, in the last episode, which was last Saturday, we talked about the majority of the last great cruise. So I'll bring that photo up. Oh, pff, blocked by that thing. Okay, there we go. Um, <clears throat> So that is a map of the last great cruise route. And we pretty much talked about, I guess, like every stop along the way, all the way up till Acapulco. And we kind of talked a bit about Acapulco. But in this episode, we're going to talk first about some, we're going to cover Acapulco again. But we're also going to cover some things we didn't cover in the last episode, which was the crossing the equator ceremony because there is a ceremony for going across the equator and they did it twice on the queen mary um, as you can see they crossed it on the atlantic side and they crossed it on the pacific side and then so after we talk about those two things then we're going to talk about the queen mary's um voyage from acapulco to long beach and then her arrival the whole like big party bash that happened then <laughs> you know the whole like disembarking the ship um and then we're going to talk about the ship's handover to Long Beach. And then we're going to end with the conversion of the ship to a hotel. And hopefully we can fit all of this within 90 minutes. I'm, I'm really hoping. So um, maybe we should talk first, Steve, about the equator crossing ceremony. Because that happened before they arrived in Acapulco. So um, let's see. Um... Well, actually, to be honest with you, I don't know how much of a ceremony they had. I'm sure that they did, but um, it was the first crossing, the one on the Atlantic side, that would have been the more important one because everybody on, uh, you know, well, I should say everybody, but a, a good number of passengers who were on board who had never crossed the equator before are going to be crossing it for the first time. And, uh, I mean, Shoot. Of course, I didn't pull up this information here. I had it up and let me grab it real quick. <laughs> I just pulled up a photo. Um, Shiloh will remember this one. The woman with the giant Queen Mary on her head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With the heart of Ve uh, Vela Hearts. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then I have the others on here too. I'm just pre checking to make sure I have them in the right order. Well, I guess I only have one more. Oh, were those the only two equator crossing? No, 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 because you guys also shared the other color ones. Okay. Yeah. All right. So <clears throat> from what I know about the basics of the equator crossing ceremony, basically it's like a time-honored tradition among mariners. Yeah, it goes, it goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. And basically... Um, well, don't they call people shellbacks when they do that? So so if you haven't crossed the equator yet, you're a polywog. Polywog. Yeah. Okay. And and the the ceremony is to initiate you 
into being uh, accepted as a shellback. It's not just crossing the equator that um, uh, that counts, but as a whole, all the polywogs designate certain people to be like the the initiators for everybody. And the initiation is, you know, if you think back to college days, I guess, um, you know, for, for a sorority or, or a fraternity, you know, you've got, you know, rather nasty. I, Debauchery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Have we, have we pulled up a picture yet? Oh, well, it was, oh yeah. There's a lady with the hat, but let's, yeah. yeah. Let's pull up one then, of those color ones with the um, okay. colorful uh, outfits. Let me. Uh, <clears throat> well, basically, me basically, you have somebody who will. One of the crew will dress up as uh, as King Neptune. Uh, well, I don't have color photos of the costumes. <gasps> what? That's there what is... I kept trying to tell you guys before the stream was I don't have that. Well, the one that we have in color is um, a lady getting hosed. Yeah. So. Okay, well, let's see the black and white ones. What you got? Okay, so for the black and white ones, I also have this one, which... Oh, wait. Oof, that's not how you open a photo. Okay. Um, okay, so this is the photo of the captain with... There's a guy with a helm on his head, and then there's three ladies behind him, each wearing a funnel hat. So, yeah, there's that. And that's it for the black and white photos I have. Of... Okay, well, that, that's that's just the that's just the the, the hat uh, yeah. thing. Uh, hat yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's it. That's all I have for black and white. Okay. I thought you had any, you don't have any of the crossing the line? No, I kept trying to tell you guys I didn't, I didn't have oh, that. Yeah. Oh, my the goodness. Only ones, the only ones I have are from the book and they're in black and white. Hold, hold on, hold on. Oh, okay, sorry, so, everyone. So, so we game. we've spent like what the last hour and a half, like going through and making sure. Okay, we want to make sure Alex got yeah. The pictures. We were double checking that I had everything that they had, and apparently they lied to me. So I blame my co-hosts, and uh, I accept no responsibility. Wow. Oh, okay. So. Okay, so yeah. Well, in the meantime, uh, I guess look for the black and white ones. <clears throat> um, I'll just grab all of these here. Shallow, why don't? You... Oh, okay. I was gonna say, why don't you just like give us the? Well, I sent you them a while ago. You did. Mm hmm. I only have two. No, it's the one that the of them on the aft docking bridge. Yeah, it was all outside. It was on the aft docking bridge. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they're, the, the they're, color ones. They're, no, no. Oh. Black and white and color. Yeah, oh, black and I think you both color in black and white. <laughs> I don't remember this. I don't... No, they're, they're all coming to you here in just a second. Well, the one you had up... I don't know if there's a delay, <clears> but <throat> the one you had up, in, that's in the veranda grill. What I'll do is if you post them directly into Discord, I will... I will just put Discord on the screen. Okay. All right, here they come. Here okay. they come to save the day. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I know, like everybody's like, why aren't they prepared? But we we were we were literally working on being prepared. But and, these and, live streams they never go as planned. Oh golly! <laughs> okay, I gotta send them in bunches. Okay, so let's see. I'll do. Three. Yeah, you can send them all at once. Okay, there we go. Yeah, no wait. Did you a ten limit? So, uh, Conrad asks, was was many of the crew, um, f was it their first time crossing the equator? That's a good question. I, I, it was probably a mix because you had a lot of people on board who, you know, are you know worked on other Cunard ships that definitely across the equator. You know, Queen Mary didn't, you know, during her normal career. You know, she did win in World War II, but... Um, well, later in the the cruises. Right. Well, no, not even in any of the cruises because, you know, you know, she just covered the Mediterranean or or the 
you know, the Northern Caribbean islands. Well, so yeah, I guess yeah. So you didn't cross the equator, but you know, if you were on, if you were assigned on Coronia, uh, or any of the, um, or, know, or the cargo ships, the, the the or the cargo ships, or the four Canadians that you know that did uh, cruises in their off season, you know, they had all the opportunity to cross the equator. So it was probably a mix. So when you're you're a polywog, you're a polywog. Doesn't matter whether you're a crew or a yeah. passenger. But uh... oh, wait a minute. I was wondering if you could send the photos individually because when you send them in groups, I I have to open them and then that closes out our images and all that. Okay, you want me to send them individually? Okay. Yeah. Here they go. Yeah, because those are the ones I sent you. You didn't send me these. Uh, they must have gotten lost because the color, the color ones of the lady being washed, and that those three I have, but the black and white ones he's sending now, you never sent those to me. Well, they must have been the, the, the conjoined group, and they got lost. Maybe. Likely story. These are like I could swear this is my first time seeing these. I've never <laughs> seen these before. Well, I mean, there's a lot of pictures. Oh so, man. Okay, that's all of them. You got them. Okay, so what I will do is I will move. Let me put this. Oh, oh that moves us down. Okay, uh, I can move us down this much. There we go. <clears throat> um, Moonser said it would not be the first time the Queen Mary crossed the equator. We said that, yeah, during yeah, World War. Yeah, no, II. she did during yeah during World War. Yeah, II. she did during World War Two. But but this, in peacetime, this was yeah. the first time. It would be the first time she crossed it in just regular passenger service. Right. Uh, okay, so I just realized that these photos don't look very good. Okay, so anyway, um, well, and because they're they're small on the screen, you'll see. Now you're getting second. now you're getting picky. <laughs> I'm getting picky because I in. <laughs> okay, um, all right. So uh, let me go up to. Mar Martina CZ says you guys need a secretary, boy, and how you are seriously right. like <laughs> honestly. Okay, so first we have these color photos. Unfortunately, two of them are too small that, for you guys to really see. But what the well, because you sent those color ones in a in a, um, in a group of three, so it comes out as like three oh, small photos. Oh, I can send you the big ones. And uh, I'm sorry. Okay, um, but oh. this next photo you can see that looks like Captain Jones on the docking bridge and yes yeah who else is on the docking bridge with him what's going on in there um the beginning of the ceremony so the what so the beginning of the they, ceremony. so they're hosing her off but she had been see there's a bucket by the uh well, he's talking about the the first black and white photo of captain jones standing on the bridge oh black. that one okay um, well, to be honest with you, I can't, I don't recognize anybody in there. Um, well, except Jones. Yeah, except uh, for, I, except for Captain well, Jones. I see a microphone, it looks like, in front of him. Yeah. So I think that's just the beginning of the ceremony. Okay. And then the next photo is some fat guy being washed for some oh, yeah. reason. Yeah. Ooh. So, so part of the initiation is is to be, you know, covered in something that's rather disgusting. And so, uh, from what I understand, they, um, it was um, ground up fish, Ugh. and mm. and bilge water. <laughs> uh, they said it was bilge water, bilge water. I don't know if it was really bilge water or not, but, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> okay. I don't. I don't know if I would want to go through the ceremony, but you know, they're <laughs> taking. They're taking the sacrifice for everybody else. Yes, okay. Yeah. Okay. That's that's. And see, it's basically you have, you have the um, the 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 gestures of the court who are working the whole initiation. They're the ones who are following through with the you know getting the passengers and crew. You know, there's there's volunteers that that come up. At, at, you know, in the beginning, and mm -hmm. then King Neptune is actually uh, 
there is somebody dressed up as King Neptune, and he is the overseer. You know, he's basically the overseer of the ceremony, but above him would be the captain. So there's a photo of a woman who's also covered in that stuff. Mm -hmm. There's another woman. And another. These people are wearing like, I don't know. I don't know how to describe those hats. Like they're like, reminds me of like, uh, that, that episode of, uh, Laurel and Hardy where they join the sons of the desert. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's the there's King Neptune. Yeah, in his royal robe or garb or whatever you call it, and his triton. And then there's the captain and King Neptune, kind of just chatting on the docking bridge. No, I, got... I've I've never actually been on a cruise that's crossed the equator, so I couldn't tell you personally what it's like, but. You know, this is the type of ceremony that you will get on on board any ship, whether it's a, a freighter, yeah, it, whether it's a naval ship, uh, or uh, or or a cruise ship. The cruise ships will do crossing the line ceremonies because you you always have somebody on board who has never crossed the equator, and they're a polywog, and they need to be accepted into you know the loyal order of shellbacks. <laughs> <laughs> Moons are yes. This these photos were taken on uh, on the docking bridge, mm -hmm. and then now we're going into the color photos. So there's there's a woman being hosed down. She's also on the docking bridge, so that's looking up at the docking bridge. And then <clears throat> there's a photo of the crowd, kind of just looking on, just watching the ceremony. Which should be um, the people in the foreground would be directly underneath that, or they would be directly underneath the ceremony. Yeah, yeah. And and mind you, by this time, the ship was already reaching like near 100 degree weather. The mm -hmm. the uh, temperatures were pretty bad. And what was making it worse was that the the ocean temperature was actually high, which was what was allowing the air conditioning not to work what little air conditioning there was. So there was no relief for people. <laughs> There certainly wasn't. <clears throat> but yeah, the last photo is of both the docking bridge and the people below the docking bridge. You can kind of see on the left is the um, one of the red buses, one of the, mm -hmm. the um, London buses. And it looks like the doorway to the bus is covered uh, in plastic, probably it to does, protect it from the weather. Yeah, mm -hmm. I noticed that too, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so that is the crossing the line ceremony. So let me close this thing and move this back up there we go um <clears throat> so after the ceremony what came next well i think we're gonna go back to acapulco right back to we'll acapulco just, yeah we'll just cover acapulco from there okay let me go ahead and pull up the acapulco fic uh, i was gonna say fixtures pictures acapulco um, pictures. Moons asked, did they already take the telegraph and helm off the docking bridge? They only did that during the conversion. That was yeah. the, that of was course the, purpose it, of the I, docking bridge. Was I mean, Moons, the, the helm. Moons, it would definitely be there. The, the ship yeah. is still operating. They're not yeah. taking the stuff off the yeah. ship yet. That's the whole purpose of the, the aft docking bridge. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. Where, okay, so <clears throat> we showed most of the Acapulco Pope pictures Jeez, i can't even talk um oh here is one that we didn't show so let me open that put that in place and then i'll turn the screen there we are so this is a picture of queen mary as a boat well it's taken from a boat that is speeding away from the queen mary mm -hmm. um but that is queen mary in acapulco so you can kind of see her in the background if i zoom in you can kind of see her just a little bit better but yeah, I think it's so cool to think like the ship, which was designed for the North Atlantic, designed to go from Southampton to Cherbourg to New York, it, you know, what, 31 years later is going to all these like exotic ports, you know, on the final journey. It's just it's a crazy thought when you think about it. 
And I'm yeah. talking uh, from a ship being from the 30s, seeing uh, an ocean liner from the 30s, you know, in the 1960s, almost almost 70s, doing cruises, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then the next photo I have for you guys... Oh, that's not even... I clicked the next button. It should have gone to the next photo, but instead it it randomized. What in the world? So I'll, I'll, is... I'll, while you're doing that, I'll cover a few things about Acapulco really quick that I don't think we covered. Um, it, first off, it was really bad that they actually had to go into the bay. I mean, there was no getting around that, but you know, the weather was was somewhat warm, like high 80s. But when they brought the ship into the bay there at Acapulco, the weather, uh, the water temperature inside the bay was extremely warm. So air conditioning, again, wasn't working well. So Acapulco was the point where anybody who was anybody came down to board. They made arrangements to get booking to sail just from Acapulco to Long Beach. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, that was, you know, that was press. You know, you had all the, you know, CBS, NBC, ABC, um, Associated Press, um, uh, BBC. I think I, I'm pretty sure there were people from the BBC on board. But they all came to uh, and needed accommodation. So they were going to get cabins. You had Hollywood come. Robert mm-hmm. Stack and his wife came on board. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other celebrities. Um, not for entertaining. They just simply came just to to be there for the, the final portion of the cruise. Um, you had everybody from Long Beach come on board. The mayor, the, the, the uh, mayor pro tem, the, a lot of the city council. Um, you had the lieutenant governor of California came. Um, the problem was was that it was very uncomfortable on board. <laughs> well, so they, and, and when, they, when, she was, when she was in port, the even the air scoops would be no use because she wasn't moving. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and, and it wasn't until she actually got out of Acapulco that things kind of mellowed out. But while she was there, and she was only there for a little over a day, um, let's see, she arrived there. Uh, she got in at nine o'clock on the fifth, and she left at ten o'clock on the on the sixth. Right? Let's see. Wait a minute. Is that right? The, uh, yeah, that's right. I just pulled up a photo that you just sent earlier of the Queen Mary's in the background, mm-hmm. and the foreground is some kind of naval vessel. Um, that's Valparaiso. About... Yeah. Oh, that's Valparaiso. Okay, so wrong port, but. Anyway, this is a photo we didn't show you guys in the last episode. And uh, yeah. you had some inf- interesting information on the vessel there. Y- yeah, it was. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Can we blow that up a little bit? Oh, there we go. So that is. Um... Oh, crap. We put I put all these notes away because we weren't going to talk about that. Uh, that is a former U.S. Navy cruiser uh world war ii i believe it's a brooklyn class cruiser that sounds familiar. um it it has since it had been sold to the the um to the chilean navy and they renamed it i'm ah shoot now i can't think of any of the name um their entire navy by this point was all former uh, u.s navy fleet and uh, this was probably, I, they didn't have anything bigger than these, but, you know, this was a very large cruiser. Um, uh, sister to the um, the one that was sank, sunk by the uh, British, the, the Argentine Navy had in the, the Falkland Islands War. I can't think of the name of that one either. Oh, good grief. This is what it's happened. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, uh, uh, beautiful, beautiful photo, though. I love that photo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so Queen Mary leaves Acapulco on the way to Long Beach. That's the final leg of the journey. Um, Let's talk about some things that happened on that leg of the journey. So what came first? Was it the um, 
the final well the final party was the night before they arrived right so when was the dc9 thing so that was on the morning of the 8th so that would be the the day before the mm -hmm. so she left she left acapulco on the 6th um okay. in in the morning and actually uh from what i was reading there was not a lot of activity on board it was like uh everybody had a little bit too much you know <laughs> too much socializing too much partying and so the the uh the whole day of the seventh the, the the rest of the sixth because it left in the morning the whole rest of the sixth and even into the seventh people were kind of um either recovering from all of the partying par, par, partying or they were also being faced with the fact that they had to pack yeah um so there was a little bit of like a a, a wave of depression that kind of swept the ship a little bit um but everybody basically was trying to get packed by the seventh so that that allowed them to enjoy the eighth as much as they possibly could. And uh, so on the morning of the eighth was uh, the arrival of a, it was a DC nine dash 200, I believe it was uh, not owned. You know, it wasn't a, uh, assigned to a uh, an airline it was one of the uh test flight models for uh for, Wait, the uh, photo i just Douglas. pulled up is labeled december 9th is that um it hasn't showed up with me yet it's the um it's the color one that you sent me mm -hmm. there's a little caption at the bottom well, that is absolutely wrong, because <laughs> because oh. that definitely happened on the eighth. Okay, you know she, what? I have. She would have been along the um the northern Baja coast at this time, so it was you know maybe a little over an hour flight out from Long Beach. Um, she made three passes over the ship, and on the third pass was. Uh, they opened the aft air stairs uh, on the aircraft and attempted to, because they didn't really, the wind conditions and all that kind of blew them off. It didn't quite land on the ship, but they tried to douse the ship with uh, uh, pink and white carnations. And they that was a, a recreation or a, a kind of an ode to the Queen Mary's maiden arrival in New York. Because uh, when she arrived in New York, a DC-2 flew over the Queen Mary. And uh, Eddie Rickenbacker uh, was actually controlling that aircraft. He was uh, pilot in command on that aircraft. And they dumped pink and white carnations on the Queen Mary on her maiden arrival in New York. So they tried to do the same thing here. Oh, yeah. Well, there's the uh, carnations coming out of the air stairs. Mm-hmm. By the way, Steve is right. the The carnation dropping from the plane happened on December eighth, so that photo was labeled incorrectly. Shame on them. Shame, shame. I know your name. All right, so that was the carnation drop, which was probably gonna, probably a really cool thing that happened because just this plane flying right over the top of the ship. Yeah. But um. All right, so that was let me exit out of those, but yeah, that is such a cool photo of the plane over the ship. Yeah, that's one of my favorite photos. Okay, so uh, the morning of December 9th, um, how well, like where do we begin, you know, because so much happened that morning, but basically, from what I recall, the dawn of December 9th, uh, the Queen Mary was, it's not even, I was going to zoom into the map, but I'm like, you can't see Long Beach from this map. Um, so the morning of December 9th, it was the crack of dawn and they were approaching Newport Beach just off the coast. And that's when um, Captain Jones and a lot of the crew started noticing that uh, boats were starting to come out 
uh, from the harbors and follow them. Um, and as they sailed further up the coast, uh, as you know, the, the sunlight started to brighten in the sky more and more and more boats. Soon they were joined by, um, uh, what do you call them? Uh, minesweepers and other naval ships. So let me get a photo. Probably I'm going to choose one that, uh, I'm choosing one that kind of looks like the earlier part of the morning. I don't want to so, reveal all the boats just yet. So she was actually reaching the coast of San Diego about three o'clock in the morning. And they realized that they were a little bit ahead of schedule. So he had reduced the speed almost like a dead slow uh, through portions of her coming up the coast. She arrived off the coast of of Newport Beach about seven in the morning. And by that time, the sun was up, and boy, Captain Jones was, he was um, concerned that they were going to be uh, covered up by fog. He thought either fog or smog. He said either fog or smog is going to, you know, block everybody's view, but it actually turned out to be a, a really beautiful morning. It was a little breezy, but it was a very beautiful morning. And, and it was about Newport Beach when the first groups of, uh, boats started to show up and uh he he was at he was asked by somebody of um you know are you concerned about the about the boats and and he basically said he said well he said they better stay out of my way because i know where i'm going and if they get in my way well then they get in my way but uh he was uh not going to let them uh, interfere with his, uh, you know, with his uh, last remaining portion of the voyage. And in fact, uh, they didn't, according to this book here. Uh, aha. The fleet of followers continued to trail in her wake. I can't say enough about the discipline of these yachts, Captain Jones said. Yeah. They are politely giving the Queen Mary a lane of one cable clear. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Captain Jones missed the collision of a sailboat and a minesweeper, um, or the near collision of the tug Angelus Gate with another minesweeper. That's pretty interesting. So boats were colliding with each other, but not with the Queen Mary. <laughs> right. Um, the nuclear cruiser USS Long Beach uh, also was escorting the ship along the way. I don't have a photo of that. I have like video of it, but I'd have to like get to that part of the video to show you guys. But here's another photo. This one appears to be. I don't think that's a minesweeper. That might be too big to be a minesweeper, but. but well, it could be. It could be. But yeah, so I'm just showing people fo color photos of the arrival. Okay. And let's see. So what was really surprising, and I'll go ahead and pull up yet another photo. Wait, where's the HD version of that one? Oh, I don't think I'd have it. Okay, I'll just put this one up then. Um, but as she got closer to Long Beach, more and more and more boats showed up to the point where Captain Jones had estimated about 5,000 craft were there yeah. showing up to greet the ship as she approached Long Beach, which <laughs> is quite literally the largest welcoming any ship has ever received, um, even to this day, no ship has has had a welcoming that big before yeah. or ever since. So that was definitely history in the making. Um, and then, let's see. So I actually really do like this picture. Uh, Shiloh, it's the, it's the color picture off the starboard side showing one of the minesweepers and then a whole oh. bunch of boats off in the distance. Yeah, yeah. the bridge wing. Yeah, it's like as far as the eye could see, there's just boats. Yeah, boats. <laughs> you, 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 you don't even get a, a, an understanding of 5,000 boats. 5, 
thousand boats and yeah. each boat filled with like a family of people yeah yeah probably probably to... overloaded to their and this, you know their rated uh capacity this um this photo isn't even accounting for the, the boats you can't see uh to the right bow of the ship or to the port side of the ship right this is just a tiny window and there's already too many to count and i yeah and i got a photo here somewhere that's a bit of a wider shot i'm gonna look for it just speaking of that overcrowding and uh, on the boats and things like that is that uh, I've heard from the, the newsreels that people apparently saw like people throwing uh, silverware overboard or various kinds of things and people would actually dive off of the boats and retrieve them. Yeah. Yes. It, it, the, uh, oh, uh, yeah, it, the, uh, the request for us, you know, throw us down a souvenir yeah. was becoming rampant and uh it was going from you know you know uh you know menus and and uh coat hangers you know small yeah. stuff it was getting to the point of like i think even deck chairs yeah. small pieces of furniture um anything yeah. that was loose and could be grabbed easily was was being grabbed and and finally ships officers kind of put a halt to that yeah but and and some items didn't make it into the you know to the clutch of their hands. It it actually went into the drink and went to the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> so you know yeah, maybe if you go if you go diving down there, you might find some stuff. That'd be, yeah, that'd be cool. Wonder what's down there. <clears throat> Here's a slightly wider shot of Queen Mary just outside what they call Queen's Gate. And for those that don't know, the harbor of Long Beach is surrounded by a massive breakwater that is like, I think like two or three miles off the coast. Um, and it was named in like the 1920s or 30s. It was named in the 1930s actually. Um, I believe 1933 is when it was built and it was named Queen's Gate. It had nothing to do with Queen Mary, but it was just a huge coincidence that yeah. Queen yeah. Mary entered Long Beach through Queen's Gate. But yeah, so here's a this is a, a photo of Queen's Gate with a lot of the boats surrounding it. And you can even see more boats entering the harbor. There's Coming, boats way off in the distance in the harbor. Coming to so, yeah. 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 So that that is Queen's Gate. There are there are two main entrances into the the port of Long Beach in Los Angeles. And this is Queen's Gate, which would be your your the port of Long Beach entrance. Mm -hmm. Um and everybody was expecting her to swing to starboard and make her 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 entry in but she was way too early so the captain decided we're gonna we're gonna go out past so she actually went past queen's gate um almost to angel's gate which is the entry into the port of los angeles or into san pedro and uh, so she made a swing up to angel's gate and then came back around and then made her entrance into queen's gate but everybody thought that maybe it was the captain decided he wasn't ready to retire and we're going to go, <laughs> we're going to go head off to some other port where I'm going to keep the ship. And here is yeah. a photo. I think this is after Queen Mary and yeah, Queen Mary's in the Harbor of Long Beach, but on her way to Pier E. <clears throat> and that even, show up. The, I mean, the crowd from the boats alone was immense, but there's also an immense crowd on the shore. Yes, in fact, in this photo I just pulled up, in the background you can see a breakwater that has a road on top of it. And that road, you can't, you can hardly tell from this photo because it was taken so far away, but there are like hundreds of cars lined up along this road, yeah. like just piled up with people waiting to see. In fact, I have a photo taken have, from that road looking at the Queen Mary. And then you have the vans, the RVs. <laughs> trucks people standing on the roofs yeah so so yeah. so way off in that part so you're looking at the the new pier really being under construction and off to the distance there um to the upper right corner is where she is now yeah. this port has increased in size tremendously and it no longer looks like this anymore but you can see where pier j now pier h and you can uh, see part of the skyline there too right you can see the the aquarium 
Yeah. That's that, that's the biggest item, which is the uh, the cylindrical. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, Building. Con uh, convention center. No. Hmm. Um, Shiloh, can you help me find? There's a uh, there's a color photo. <clears throat> Looking from the point of view of the RVs and the cars, looking at Queen Mary as she's, you know, pulling into the, 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 the ones I have are, um, it's their color, but it's taken from the ship looking at the RVs and it's like a close up view. I don't have one from the RVs. Oh, darn. I had one from the RVs and I'm like, looking at it, I'm like, where is my photo? Oh, remember that one in the cluster of four? It has the, because there's another photo of just people. Yeah, there. I was gonna put that one up next. Yeah. Because it's the only other one I have that shows the RVs, but. Yeah, um, that's the only color one I have of that, that particular thing. I, I so, want to correct myself. Um, I said that was the aquarium, and I that's not the the Long Beach Aquarium that we know today. That it is the convention, the Long Beach Convention Center, but. Yeah. I call it the aquarium because it's got the it's got those paintings of the whales. Yeah. Um. By uh. Oh, what's his name? The 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 whale artist guy. Yeah, I can't um, remember his name. I can't think of his name either. But it, yeah. So yeah, it looks like a big aquarium because it's you know it's got all the the paintings yeah. of the whales. But yeah, you can see the uh the convention center over there, which is still there today. Yeah, and that's the picture I was talking about with all the RVs and people. Yeah. I have and a it, picture taken from the RVs looking at the ship, but that's okay. Oh, but... oh yeah. Oh, you just brought up that one picture. See all the luggage? Um, oh, yes. Oh, okay, yeah. so I see all the RVs, yes. But the so one... first, RVs, cars, people in the foreground. Oh, I'm going to move down to the luggage if you want to talk about the luggage now. Yes, I do. Yep. So this photo is of... I'm not I don't I don't think all the passengers luggage, but the majority of the passengers luggage piled up on our deck right yeah. in front of the first class swimming pool. Um, Queen Martin. Mary, like we said in the last live stream, they didn't book any of the third class rooms on Queen Mary, because first of all, this was the last great cruise. The last thing you want is to give people a bad impression of the ship by making them stay in third class. So. All the first class and a majority of the second class space, all the nice second class spaces were um, booked up for the last great cruise. But there were the lower, like the, the, the second class spaces that were located on like C deck, for instance, probably wouldn't have been used. They were too small and too near the boilers and all that stuff. So they would have used just the nicer rooms all on main A and B decks. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, yeah, probably probably mostly the you know the second class cabins that were mostly um, uh, you know either you know two lower beds with maybe a, a possible upper or just two lower beds and would have you know a full bathroom facility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're that paying top dollar. I mean, yeah. anywhere from a thousand dollars to nine thousand dollars for part or all of the last great cruise. And that was in 1967 money. Um, so, yeah, that is a picture of the the luggage. What do you call it? Yeah, the and luggage. There's, there's absolutely no way that it's everybody's luggage. There's yeah, yeah. And let's see here. It, oh, whoops! Oh, darn it! <laughs> Where'd it go? Uh, okay. So here is a photo um, of Queen Mary entering the the long beach harbor and you can see one of the fire boats are um spraying their hoses that's what kind of like what you do when a ship arrives um but yeah you can see one of the fire boats you can see one of the pilot the harbor pilot boats i believe or that just could be a tugboat mm -hmm. um in the foreground um some of the signal flags blowing um let me find the um the fire boat was customary that would happen in that happened in Southampton that happened in New York for her maiden voyage. And yeah, every major port of entry that she went into. Yeah. She had fire boats to welcome her. Yeah. So that, that looks like she's already entered Queens gate and yeah. yeah. Finally yeah. going to her final port. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which would and be just, here... just off to the left. Yeah. yeah. And Oh, and because this is also part of the photo, 
uh, here is a photo looking up at the main mast. At least I hope that's the main mast. That doesn't even look like the main mast. Where is that? Is it the um, one that's Captain I'm, Jones? I'm waiting for it to show no. up. Oh. It's part of that that postcard with the oh. four pictures, and it's yeah. looking up at the mast, but that mast does not look like the main mast, nor does it look like the... F it doesn't look like the, um, well, it's... the four mast either. Oh, come on, delay. Let's see what picture you're talking well, about. Well, no, I was going to say maybe that's from the crow's nest, but it's not. You know, this has to be the four mast. It has to be, because maybe. there's no other masts on the you know ship what? that look no, like that. No, because it doesn't have a yard arm. Yeah, it's true. It's just that you're looking, you're looking, at, you're looking on the forward end of the mast aft, so you don't see the... Yeah, and they would have already taken the house flags down, I think. Yeah, because if you look in the picture that well, we're about, to, wait a minute. If you well, look in the picture that we're going to bring up soon, um, of of Captain Jones saluting, it looks like they're bringing the American flag up, and that would have replaced the Cunard White Star. Yeah, that, I think yeah, that would already be in port. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, let me go ahead and just put this on then. This is a photo of people probably on that same uh, rock jetty looking at Queen Mary. This photo could actually be reversed. It could be that the ship should be pointing to the right side of the photo. But um, because the reason why I say that is because uh, from how this is angled, those people would be standing in the middle of Long Beach Harbor. So it doesn't make any sense. So I think this photo is actually reversed. Yeah. But... Um, let me go ahead and actually, I can fix that right now. Uh, I, I hate that. I hate when I'm looking at a photograph and it's, it's you know, it's stretched. Or, yeah. Right. There we go. And then save. There we go. <laughs> uh, fixing things as we go along. That's how we do it. You you really think that that photograph's reversed? I it has to be, because I'm pretty sure where these people are standing is where all those RVs were. Yeah. Hmm. Well, wait. Did the ship get into the harbor in the morning or in the afternoon? In, well, in it actually morning. entered the harbor. It it entered the harbor where those people were out on the on the jetty there that was in the well that was you know 11 o'clock yeah mm. i've seen other pictures of her stern with the with the buses taken in the same orientation so i think this is the right way as well yeah i think this is the right way yeah yeah because the sun would be in the south yeah. and it's looking okay sorry guys <laughs> we're all like we're all like looking at the picture like what forensically Okay, so there's that one. I'm just checking the comments to see if anybody's asked anything. It doesn't look like it. Okay. Um, we'll move on to the next photos. Let me exit out of some of these. Okay. Um, so let's see. What would be the next one? Oh, you know what we forgot to show was the, the party the night before. So here's a photo. Oh, yes, yes, yes. In the main lounge, the night before the ship arrived in Southern California, they held this big party bash in the main lounge. You can see a string of, well, you actually can see balloons everywhere. People are throwing balloons. There's confetti and and streamers everywhere. So, it, and, and, and it, you know, it started... Uh after dinner like around nine o'clock or so and it it literally went on all night and into the next morning yeah well there were <laughs> i i don't i i think there were quite a few passengers who actually never went to bed that night no yeah mm -hmm. yeah i've heard i've heard many because there were some people i've heard accounts from that were on the maiden voyage and they said that the party rivaled the party they had before she arrived in new york on the maiden voyage yeah 
Okay, so the next photo I'm gonna show is the ship pulling up to Pier E. So this is a color photo. It's not a very good one at that, but it, it illustrates the point. The tugboats helped push the ship up against Pier E. So this, um, was, this would be about 11.30 in the morning. Yeah. And, um, well, what, what you can hardly tell here is there's a huge tent that was set up. Um, mm. I think there was a funny anecdote about that. I think like the people who were organizing this were looking for a way to create a makeshift cruise terminal for the passengers. And so they actually had to hire like a, a circus tent company <laughs> to set up this thing. But, um, but yeah, so there's that photo. I have a color photo. This is even better showing the tent and the ship and the city of long beach in the background or, or I should say the, uh, downtown in the background but yeah this is a photo of of the ship pulled up to the harbor um and there's something interesting that is not in the camera but it's off to the right and i'll show you in the next photo but otherwise you can see all the cars every everything parked um they're preparing to uh get the passengers off the ship but there's actually a funny story about that too um i'm trying to show all these photos but i also have to organize like <laughs> the uh, the order of events but let me just go ahead and show you guys the really cool picture uh, this oh is, yeah mm -hmm. this is the queen mary at pier e wait this is actually after i'll show this later i'll talk about it later because that happened after okay so back to the color photo <clears throat> um okay so steve do you want to tell people about what it was like to get people <laughs> off of the ship <laughs> <laughs> so okay so i i want i want to cover uh stephen Hemingway asked is there any truth to that the booze up etc was need to get rid of get rid of stuff banned in the usa so all that kind of shenanigans i'm gonna we're gonna talk about in just a minute but there were shenanigans that were already going on on this whole arrival um <laughs> so the the tent was where they were going to receive the passengers. And so the tent was actually mostly a staging point for the luggage. So, uh, mind you, Customs was not on board. So U.S. Customs had to process everybody that was coming off the ship once they got off the ship. But before the passengers could get off the ship, the luggage had to get off the ship. So that was that picture that we saw earlier of our deck, the, the whole foyer completely loaded with luggage. So those were the first stages of luggage to be disembarked. Our deck was the only uh, source of gangways to get on or off the ship. And they, they had set up a passenger gangway and they had a conveyor belt gangway. Uh, now, mind you, you've got now probably close to 1,200 passengers on board with a, with about a little over 800 crew and all their luggage that has to come off. So it's now 12 o'clock. Um, the passengers have basically been said, well, you know, wait in the lounge. We'll give you the announcements. Um, the luggage had been marked according to the their time of getting off the ship so if you were a member of the press they were the first ones to get off they had a certain letter so their luggage was the first to get off it didn't go well at all it did not go well at all and they had not planned on serving lunch it was obvious by around one o'clock that, that they were going to need to be serving lunch because everybody was still on board so all of the kitchen staff and the waiters and everybody who had been told to go to go to their cabins and you know get their kit together so that they could leave later in the day were told to get back into uniform and go back to the dining room and and you know you're going to be serving lunch so they did they served they served lunch through the afternoon and uh 
they finally got the luggage off, you know, probably around two o'clock or so, and you're starting to get passengers off a little at a time. Uh, I understand that they were still, there were still passengers that were getting off and luggage that had not been retrieved yet by five o'clock. Five o'clock on December 9th, it's dark. The ship is dark. And there's yeah. still passengers and luggage being taken off. Um, so that didn't go well at all. But the thing that gets me is the you know lunch had been served, and now it's about two o'clock or so, and they're serving the last bit of people getting close to three o'clock. All of a sudden, the announcement comes to the crew in the dining room and the kitchens, "Get your stuff together. The buses will be here soon because they all were on chartered flights back to England from LAX. And they were going to be boarding buses immediately to plot to uh, get to the airport. Mm -hmm. So they literally left the tables uh, uncleared with dirty dishes. The kitchen had food still on the counters. <laughs> uh, it was a big fat mess, and we'll go into that more later. But so that was that was the arrival. <laughs> <laughs> Before we move on, um, Moons asked, what did third class do for the arriving party? There was no third, second, or first class. So we just one class. One class. And they, would, and they would use whatever nicest cabins they had in second class for basically uh, spillover rooms because um, it was sold out. So all the third class cabins are vacant. All the third class uh, spaces were mostly vacant. And same with the second class. They just kept the main ones open. Yeah, I think that... That teenager bar that they use for the overflow lounge that was open, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The but, the um the beachcomber club was open. The yeah. most of the third class areas were not open. Yeah, um, they were they were used for other purposes. And I'll give you an example: the third class dining room was turned into one big giant clothes hanger yeah. uh, because there were times when the ship couldn't get laundry services in a port. So they they figured out a way to hand wash tablecloths and and probably uniform jackets too, and hand wash them on board, and then they strung up clotheslines through the third class dining room, and then hung you know sheets, blankets, or not blankets, but you know sheets, pillowcases, uh, tablecloths, uniforms, anything that needed to be washed and then dried, it hung up to dry in the third class dining room. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, but for passenger, as uh, Moons was asking for passenger use, third class was vacant. Yep, ghost yeah. town. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a photo here uh, that I'm about to pull up. It is a, oh, of course, it's like the smallest photo in existence. Here's the here's a better one. This is of the Mermaid Bar after everybody's left the ship, and it's just covered in garbage and yeah. trash and you know there's there's still uh there's still like cocktail glasses on the bar mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. people had drank their drinks just prior to the the ship uh, yep. being emptied of passengers so i'm waiting for that that but that vote hasn't come up yet but king of battleships was asking were both swimming pools used on on for the passengers and as far as i know they were yeah, from yeah, from what I know, they were. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so anyway, that is the mermaid, uh, mermaid bar photo, and the mermaid bar, for those that don't know, was the newer second class cocktail bar that was put on promenade deck, on the starboard side, and it was only available to second class passengers. And it was removed during the conversion, but we'll get to that later because we have to talk about the conversion. But it is an absolute crime. Now, so we should, yeah, we should probably start talking about now what happened to the ship prior to conversion, and then we'll finish off with what happened during the conversion. Well, I was going to say, do you have a picture of the um, the dockside ceremony that was taking place on the ninth? We do. Oh, right. Okay. With the yeah. uh, mayor Wade, and uh, I have I have a new one. I can send in here. 
Me... So, <clears> there, <throat> uh, so there were two ceremonies that basically took place. One was the arriving ceremony. Um, I believe that they had taken the house flags. I think it was the, the house flags were taken down and, and, you know, and folded. And then they were presented to Mayor Wade um, on, you know, on a televised, you know, all the local channels were there to cover the event. And, uh, you know, the captain came off the ship and, uh, you know, he was ceremonious, you know, Mayor Wade uh, uh, was handed the, uh, the, the house flags. And, yeah. but mind you though, this is just ceremonial. Um, mm-hmm. This is the ninth. This is Saturday the ninth. So the, uh, the, the actual, business end of the transition of ownership really couldn't take place until Monday. Yeah, you had to do it on a, on a business day. So, um, although most of the crew had been sent home, the ship uh, was still functioning and still owned by Cunard until the 11th. Yeah. I just pulled up a photo of the table on sun deck where they're all signing paperwork. Now that now that's the that's going to be on the that's the eleventh that will show. <clears throat> okay. Um, I just put in because these are the ones I had found recently. There, uh, one of them was flipped, and I I fixed the orientation of it because it was reversed. But it's a uh, it's of uh, that ceremony that Steve was just mentioning, um, with Captain and Jones. Flags. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, there it is, folks. Uh, there's Captain Jones with the house flags in his hand. Um, let me go ahead and pull that. There we go. Um, so yeah. Oh, Let's um, see the ship in the back. So the here. so the I so I'm seeing right now the um the they're sitting at a table. Uh, and uh, I, oh. The other one's gonna come up soon. But did you have the, uh, the other one? I, did you put it up that I sent you of Captain Jones saluting, and it's the American flag going up on the main mast? Saluting. Uh, I didn't notice one of him saluting. It's in black and white. It's taken. Um, not not. Well, no, it's taken at like an angle looking up. Okay, no, I I'm gonna say I don't have that. Let me check in here. I sent it in here. It's it's in here. Um. Bueller. <laughs> Bueller. Oh, it, here we go. Yeah. Okay, so th- there's the photo of Captain Jones saluting as the house flags are taken down and replaced with the American flag. The American flag is on the top corner of the photo. Mm-hmm. And in the other picture, we have the main mast with the American flag already up. That was taken after because this picture was taken while that flag was being raised. I don't see that other one. No, it was in the four that you sent. The, not that, you, that I sent to you. The one has the four images of the RVs, the fireboat. Oh, and... right. That one I already showed. <clears throat> so I was saying that that oh, there it was. There it is. Yeah, I see it now. You know what? You were talking about this photograph? And I you know, I, I never even saw it. No. <laughs> well, I mean, it was like one of like what about a hundred photographs that we've been going through over the last yeah. hour or so. Yeah. You know, before we started. <laughs> yeah. Um. But I swear that that doesn't look like the main mast. It's not the main mast is black at the top, and this isn't. I was thinking it could be taken from the monkey bridge, but I'm thinking it's taken from the monkey bridge looking at the foremast, but yeah. just a really zoomed in foremast. I mean, that could be. Yeah. Well, it didn't, 
didn't the main mass also have that 31 uh how long was it the the, the pennant oh the it was 310 meters but yeah. that was uh she, she didn't fly on the last was, week cruise no but yeah I'm, it was yeah but yeah, yeah right the, the main mast is separated into two colors the yellow and the black yeah well anyway yeah. that's the mast photo um okay so that's sorry i'm just trying to keep us on track because we still have a lot to talk about well but, if, um, if, uh, so you want to go back to the 11th or, or leading up to the 11th with yeah the, table so I have the photo of them at the table okay if you want to talk about mm -hmm. that so the, I, I i will say that uh after the ninth, most of the crew had gone home. You know, had flown back to England. There was still a a uh, a, a, a engineering crew on board that was maintaining steam on the ship. The, the ship was still fully functioning on her own systems. Uh, and it was uh, oh man, it the. After this ceremony was when they actually shut down the boilers on board, and uh, the uh, one of the crew members that was interviewed that worked in the boiler rooms was this man. I wish I knew what his real name was, but he was known as Tinker. He was old, mm. old. I mean, salty, crusty guy who had been at sea for probably all his life, and. and you know, I, although he may not have been as old as I'm thinking he looked like, you know, he, you know, oh my gosh, yeah, he looked, he, he was crusty. Um, but his world was the Queen Mary. And he was the one who basically put out the fires on the last boiler, which was boiler C3. And he flew home. And I think it was literally like maybe within weeks, he died. Yeah. It was like, you know, his life was the Queen Mary. And, and now that he has no Queen Mary to, to, to call a home anymore, he had no reason to live. <laughs> and he just yeah. died. I need to find yeah. the story of, about Tinker. I, I, I know it's in a I'm book looking somewhere. For it right now. <laughs> well, then, okay. Um, I don't. Okay, I don't have one with Tinker, but there is one here. Let me see. Let me just make sure I'm reading. Okay, so this is about Charles Albert Pierce. Um, he had actually been firing the boilers since the maiden voyage of the Queen Mary. Hmm. So it says here, Charles Albert Pierce who had fired the engines for the maiden voyage began closing the valves to cool the boilers for the last time. He was 65 years old. You've been good to me. Pierce wept as he talked to the inanimate boilers as the flame flickered out. I'm retiring with you. No other ship for me. Yeah. Yeah. That could very well be Tinker, but, uh, but you know, a similar story. I mean, mm -hmm. um, and it, and it's really unfortunate because there were quite a few Cunard staff because you got to remember at this time Cunard was reducing, you know the, the fleet was being sold off, um, you know there was QE two that was coming coming on soon, but for the majority of the people that were on board, you know that was the end of their career because yeah. they didn't really see a hope, you know, or, or the possibility of of getting on to QE two, which was going to be the only ship left in the fleet and uh they were willing and ready to actually stay on you know practically live in long beach you volunteer to be uh you know um uh, assistance for the city to be able to you know make the ship function and then yeah. the city had no interest they were like no you know we, we you know thank you but no thank you you know we have the ship now. And and so going to this ceremony. So this was a ceremony where they, they uh, GT, GTE set up a telephone and I'm surprised there's no telephone on the table yet, but you know, there was a telephone that was placed and, and it had a recording and you, they contact uh, uh, Sir Basil small piece, you know, who was a uh, chairman of Cunard and uh, they, you know, they do the official, you know, 
authorization we we you know we release this from you know Kinard. and then they contact they they made a phone call to Lloyds of London and uh and had her officially removed from uh British registry mm-hmm. and uh and that was when you know when you actually had like the, the final flags taken down and all that yeah uh, and and and, and the and then the all flags, the on all the signing of the papers for ownership. Yeah, go ahead. I have I have a quote from Captain Jones about um, his experience watching them uh, pull down the house flags and put up the um, United States flag. Ah. He says there was a lump in my throat at that sight. Captain Jones admitted that ended the life of the ship RMS Queen Mary. But a new Queen Mary will emerge, which will be honored and revered in the history and glory of the old Queen Mary. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and you know there are a few photographs of Captain Jones. You know, weeping. And he was very. Yeah. He was not. I don't think he was normally an emotional person, but this really um, struck him. It did uh, and uh, and so there are there are some photographs of him, you know, wiping a tear from his eye. But uh, you know, the, the thing that's really sad is once this ceremony was over, it, again, it was within hours that they were heading to LAX to to board flights back to England, and there would be nobody left on board for uh to to handle the ship the, the ship was placed on uh emergency power so her emergency generators were running which is you know bare minimum uh equipment bare minimum lighting mm-hmm. uh, but no no steam and uh the, the, oh yeah actually we'll we'll go into that a little bit but um Oh, I'm I'm getting a little ah <laughs> yeah it's it's sad it's sad you know but and Ugh. he he went home and then was invited back to um to California he was the um he was a personal guest for Long Beach for the uh, Tournament of Roses parade yeah and and Long Beach's float that was entered was a and- a, a float of the Queen Mary. And I have a photo of actually two photos that are put together of that float. And 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 he was there, and somebody caught him again, uh, crying when he saw the parade float. Yeah. Do you have a picture of? The, oh yeah, let's see a picture of the parade float. Oh, yeah, I'm looking. I wasn't even. That. I wasn't even thinking about that. Yeah, me neither. I didn't think to get it, but here it is. What is a? What is it that Jones said about Queen Mary's? He said that she was a ship with a soul. What is the oh. words to that? Um, as far as I remember, it was that she lived, she breathed, and th- that she was the closest ship that he'd ever been on to becoming a human being or being a human being. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, no. He, she lived, she breathed, she had character. She lived, she breathed, she had character. Mm-hmm. Um, so here is the photo of the Tournament of Roses parade. This is the Tournament of Roses parade, right? Mm-hmm. Or is this yep. Long Beach? Nope. Okay. Okay, so yeah, this is the Tournament of Roses parade float. Um, for those that aren't, you know, native to Southern California, um, there is an annual, uh, parade that happens on January 1st, is it? And... It's yeah. um and it's called the Tournament of Roses Parade and basically all these floats which are made out of flowers and flower material mm-hmm. and plant material are you know showcased on this big massive parade and as Southern Californians we watch it on television every year but anyway this was uh, Queen Mary's float uh, that's a beautiful floral uh interpretation of the ship i mean it's really nice well not even that but the the water the carpet all of it yeah yeah so i just sent you in discord something you can show because this kind of gives way to what was to take place over the next few weeks after the 11th so the the parade floats get 
put on display after the parade is over. They go into a park for about a day or two. And and it, if you didn't attend the parade, you can actually go to the park and, and look at the floats b- walking around them. Well, somebody drove their car into the Queen Mary <laughs> and put a big hole in her. And, uh, yeah, that, it, it kind of signals what was to come over the next few years with her. Um, I, I, and actually, within those first few days after the after December the 11th. Mm-hmm. Now, <clears throat> I'll show some photos, just random photos of Queen Mary, um, if I have anything, of her kind of sitting around. <clears throat> um, in fact, I do have one photo, uh, the one that you showed that was... Um, taken before her boilers were put out but it was the one of her at night with the oh lockdown. yeah yeah right first night in so London. if you could quickly and i do mean quickly because we are running out of time yeah if you could quickly describe up until the the point where she belonged to long beach up until the point where she needed to go into the dry dock <coughs> so <coughs> excuse me the the photograph that you're going to show is taken while she is actually still under her own power we're figuring probably the night of the ninth maybe the ninth night of the 10th mm-hmm. but in that photograph she is under her own power she's fully lit she even has mass lights on which was uh, very surprising um so this would definitely be those that first night or the possibly the second night which was a huge difference because after December the 11th, after the big ceremony, and Long Beach now has possession of her, um, she's now on minimal emergency generator power. And now they're getting all of this information about what is going to be need to be done. And one of the first things that they are kind of informed with, as far as the Coast Guard was concerned, was... Um, that she needed to be uh, declassified as a a vessel. And the way that she would be acceptable to the U.S. Coast Guard as, as a floating structure or a barge, basically, um, is to, dis- to physically disconnect her propellers from the main gear uh, assembly on the uh, for the uh, engines and to physically disconnect the hydraulic system for her steering ram the the hydraulic cylinders that move the pistons that would m- move her rudder so she's she can't steer she can't be um, mobile on her own she would have to be towed uh, now that had to be done I think like within a week of of you know her arrival um otherwise the city was going to have to either tow her out past the international uh boundary uh, or she was going to have to seek a flag of convenience registry with another country she couldn't register in the u.s because she's a foreign flagship to begin with um, and the Jones Act wouldn't have allowed her to to be U.S. flight, and she's now removed from British registry. So she's now a basically a unlicensed, unregistered you know vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so uh, the Coast Guard is basically saying, "Yeah, okay, so you've got uh, seven days. You need to do all this." So the story that I've been told is that Long Beach contacted their their main maintenance yard, you know, that handles, uh, you know, city vehicles, uh, you know, fire engines, um, you know, other maintenance vehicles for the city and and calls up their maintenance yard to come down to, to pier E to, to do this work, to disconnect the propeller shafts and disconnect the, the, the hydraulic lines on the steering rim. And so they showed up with toolboxes and, the thing that's laughable about showing up with toolboxes is the fact that the propeller shaft is bolted on. Uh, there's a flange on the propeller shaft that where uh, it, you know, one flange comes to the other and they're all bolted in. 
and you can see those today. But those, the nuts and the, the heads of the bolts that connect one planet to the other on the propeller shaft, we're talking, you know, six inch, seven inch bolts. Not a tool that you're going to have in a toolbox that you're going to be carrying on board, which was really funny. So they had sent these guys down, mind you, minimal power, minimal lighting. In some cases, they had to use flashlights to find their way down to the engine room. And they did find their way down to the engine room. And they found the propeller shafts. And they looked at those nuts and bolts on the flange of the propeller shaft. And they said, oh, my God, we don't have any tools that size in the yard. And we're, we're going to have to use oxyacetylene torches to cut this. So that's what they did. And they brought in oxyacetylene torches and they cut the propeller shaft free from the, uh, from the main gear. And the ironic thing about that is the fact that if somebody had been there to tell them that literally only feet away, hanging up on the bulkhead, and in fact, still today, hanging up on the bulkhead is the ratchet and the uh, the wrench and the the, the the wrench and the and the um, the the the, uh, the driver piece, you know, for the nut, so that you can remove the nuts and bolts off the flanges of the propeller shafts. But they <laughs> didn't see them; they didn't know that they were there. So, so they went through all that oxy uh through the, all the oxygen and the acetylene to cut those propeller shafts free mm -hmm. um so um what okay so i want to show pictures of the conversion work so okay. was there anything done at pier e first because i'm pretty sure I, I have photos of the ship it looks like they're removing stuff from it but i don't know if it's at pier e or if it's in the dry dock so between so between december of 67 and april of 68 very little was done to the ship um they were really awaiting because they were expecting the ship to go to dry dock in february and um unfortunately it was blocked by um protesters because the uh, um the the uh ship workers were saying we you know uh you know the ship is going to be worked on by uh non-union labor and so they were protesting against it and they did a kind of a boat blockade to prevent her from being towed into dry dock so she didn't make it to dry dock until april it was after her dry dock where work at pier e began and okay. and and it, within within the latter part of '68 was when you started noticing physical differences that were happening on board. Okay, so I have photo photos of them removing, like they have parts that belonged in the boiler rooms, and they're sitting on a dock. Is that at the dry dock or is that at Pier E? No, I'm waiting for the foot. Can you have the? No, I'm waiting for the oh, Photoshop. Well, I'd like to show the stuff first that like is in order because i don't want to show people so it, so out of order. so anything that if you're seeing like boiler room engine room you know anything that's been put dockside that's well after the the um the dry dock that's actually probably closer to 69 70. okay so dry dock came first oh yeah absolutely okay okay so let me show the dry dock um so, by the way, that photo that's been on the screen, folks, that's the USS New Jersey sitting at the dock um, with Queen Mary behind it, just in case anybody wants to know. Here is a photo of Queen Mary in the old naval dry dock, <clears throat> which was still part of the Navy back then. Um, this dry dock no longer exists. It has been completely filled in and is part of the um, the cargo offloading for cargo freighters today but yeah. <clears throat> that's the ship in the dry dock and i got plenty more i got stuff of them working underneath but <clears throat> the main thing that they needed to do in the dry dock and let me pull up a photo um where is it well here's another one just in, just for now but um <clears throat> in this photo you can see workers are doing um 
some minor like cleaning and and repaint work so they've scraped off a lot of the dirt and barnacles and stuff off the bottom of the hull of the ship and they're starting the the process of applying a new coat of um anti-fouling paint on the ship an extra thick coat from what i learned um and then they've also i was looking for a photo that i was so sure i had i could have sworn i had a photo of this but of of one of queen mary's propeller shafts uh was uh you could see that the propeller was removed and they had put a cap on the end that was welded on um I, I could have sworn I had that photo. I have, picture, like, so I have a picture of them actively removing the propeller. You do? Okay. Yeah. Well, now, the, that the propeller that you see here in this photograph is the one that's in the box now today. The one that right. you actually yeah. can see in the box. Yeah. So that yeah. one, and I'll show, I'll show the box for people who want to see. So this is the box that surrounded that propeller. So the propeller you see right there in that photo is covered by this box today um a lot of, you know i you know what i see a lot is people say oh they cut a huge section out of the queen mary and then put a box over i'm like no they didn't do that they cut two holes one for a door into the box and a door for out of the box it's just a little like seven foot tall door they didn't cut a huge section out of the hull they just welded this box to the side of the ship and it enclosed the the last remaining propeller. Uh, and that was to give it a, it's resting in a pool of fresh water uh, to help prevent um, corrosion. What? The picture I just sent, I sent to one of them to removing the propeller and the other one actually <clears throat> them building the box. Oh, okay. So let me pull that down. Yeah. So that picture of the box, I mean, that, that all the, it's completely uh, finished. And so within days of this photograph would have been, um, uh, the refilling of the dry dock for her floated back out to uh, back to Pier E. Yeah. Now here's the photo that uh, Shiloh had sent. So here, this first one is them removing the propeller from the propeller shaft. You can see the, the propeller is covered in grime. Um, so this looks to be. Well, I'm not gonna. No, yeah, this looks like this looks like the out outboard starboard propeller in this photo. Um, and then in the next photo, you can see, uh, the two inboard, um, propeller shafts on either side of the, uh, rudder. By the way, the rudder is still on the Queen Mary. They did not remove the rudder. Yeah. Um, and the, these propeller shafts, the ends, you can see they're hollow. Um, they would eventually cover those with a steel cap. And that would be welded on to prevent water from coming into the ship through the propeller shaft openings. Um, and like I said, I had a photo of that. I, I could have sworn I put it here to show everybody. And it's like not here now. It just, it, you know, we had this problem before the live stream started. Like Shiloh and I were talking about how like we were like queuing stuff up and we we're like, wait a minute. Like we both had this photo. We know we had this photo and then it's gone now from both our computers. Of yeah. course. So <laughs> even though we had deliberately saved that photo. Yeah, exactly. Like we had deliberately saved the photo for the live stream. Yeah. And you know it's just like gone. So but, um, we, I was gonna say why you why you because you were talking about the caps of the uh, propeller shafts. There were a total of two hundred and fifty five openings in the hull that had to be um, basically patched over and sealed off. You know that included all the sea chests. You know for the um, uh, you know for the uh, main condenser feed. You know uh, for the pumps for the engine room condensers and for the, uh, the turbo generator condensers, um, any, anything in and anything out other than scuppers, mm -hmm. you know, anything, anything below the waterline had to be capped. Yeah. Everything. And there's, um, even the, I think he just said it, the stabilizer fins that the ship had. They oh yeah. Had those these, too. Yeah. They mm -hmm. had these large openings for the stabilizer fins. Those had to be completely covered over. In fact, uh, I think I just showed a photo actually. Uh, no, never mind. But this this is a good example. These are brand new steel plates underneath the this propeller shaft, 
And um, it was areas like this that new steel plates had to be put in. Although this particular area, I'm not sure why they chose to do that, but they chose to do it nonetheless. But um, yeah, so brand new steel plates were put over areas that really needed it. But let me go back to the picture of the dry dock. So in this photo, you can see they've already added the, the propeller box and they've already capped one of the um, out the inboard propeller shafts. Mm -hmm. You can see the rudder is still there. Um, and what else are they doing? They haven't added the stairwells or anything yet. I'm pretty sure they haven't. They won't do that till till it gets back to Pier E. But yeah, so that is it at the dry dock. And I'll then, tell you. I'll tell you a really quick story though about yeah. about what happened at the dry dock. It was like I think within a day or two after she had been uh you know sat onto her blocks in in dry dock and that was uh the basically an aftershock to the 1952 tatsby earthquake and it happened on april 8th uh, 1968 and it was let's see i'm finding what it was on the richter it was a 6.6 .6 on the richter scale um and it was uh It was strong enough to be felt to where the Queen Mary was rocking on her blocks. And everybody who was under, you know, under the ship, you know, between blocks, you know, immediately, you know, you know, seeked <laughs> a, a distance away. But she came very close. If she had rocked off her blocks in dry dock, it could have been the end for the Queen Mary right there. That's it was a very close call. And and this is just proof when somebody says they could just permanently dry dock her in, in Long Beach, you can't because for this very reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the, that's the thing is that uh, first of all, she'd be the largest ship ever permanently put on land. Um, yeah. And nobody knows what how that would go fully because we've never done it before. But the other thing, too, is that the ship isn't designed to be permanently put on land. Her hull is designed to be supported from all sides, exactly. like a giant, you know, it's cradled by the ocean. Right. And so if she was only being supported with all that vertical load, um, eventually she would deform and get misshapen and that would cause all kinds of maintenance issues. Yeah. And people hate it when I say that it would be a bad thing. It's like, oh, you can fix anything. Yes, you can fix anything, but that doesn't mean you have the money to fix everything. Yeah, you know, so you know that's just, yeah, people drive me yeah. crazy sometimes. But um, okay, so now we're gonna show photos of Queen Mary um at Pier E again, but this time them removing things from the ship. And well, first I think they did this first. They started removing the whistles from the um. We started removing the whistles from the the funnels, and then they at the simultaneously they were um, starting to uh, paint the ship in like a gray primer, and so you can kind of see that happening in this photo. In fact, this photo still looks like it was done from the dry dock. So, oh, but yeah, yeah, but um, let me explain first why a lot of the ship's interiors were removed. And I'll try to do it as quickly as possible so we can get this, get this done. But basically the whole reason, like the whole reason Queen Mary was purchased uh, by the city of Long Beach was because they wanted to build a giant museum of the sea inside the ship. Now you're probably thinking, well, why do that? Why not just preserve the ship as a museum itself? Well, like Steve and I said, well, and Shiloh said in the last episode, no one had ever opened a a ocean liner hotel museum before. Queen Mary yeah. was the first in the world to be an ocean liner hotel and museum. And nobody really knew what the what the public would want out of an ocean liner museum. You know, ocean liners still existed when Queen Mary retired. So, you know, there was there was no 
you know, this whole love that people had with ocean liners after James Cameron, you know, made Titanic and everybody became obsessed with ocean liners after that. There wasn't any of that in 1967. When people thought of ocean liners, they thought of these aging ships that, you know, that people that, you know, their parents would sail on to get to and from. People didn't think of these things as romantic vessels in the way that maybe, um, you know, a, a, uh, what do you call it? A seafarer might, you know? So, um, and really the love that people had for Queen Mary was, it, it it's similar to the love we have of her today, but in a way different. Uh, it wasn't that we, you know, people loved her because she was an ocean liner. People loved her because of the luxury, the stories, the history, the wartime service, that kind of thing. But some people only love the Queen Mary today because they think she's just this beautiful old ship. Right. I think so. I I think the world as a whole, you you kind of fall in and you fall out of appreciation for history, and mm-hmm. and by the late 1960s, we were certainly not in a time where you know the the you know society appreciated the history, and so mm-hmm. the Queen Mary was looked at as a you know she did have some history to her. And they wanted to represent that, but there was nothing, you know, the idea of preservation for the ship was not there. Um, Mm -hmm. They were looking at the ship purely as a venue. And, you know, so to, to, to talk about having her gutted to make way for new displays, new exhibits, new, a new museum, you know, the, you know, we, we cry out today like, oh, my God, how could they have possibly done that? But, you know, the, the mindset then was, you know, there was no appreciation for it. So it, it's sad. It's sad. But yeah. And uh, King but, of Battleships in the comments says they should have just done the conversion with a thought out plan. But the thing is, they did. They had a thought out plan. Yeah, what but, yeah, but but plans, you know, things also change. I mean, you know, just look at Disney. They build stuff all the time, and sometimes their plans have to change as they're constructing it, um, which is exactly what happened to Queen Mary. It's no different than what happens anywhere else. But the thing is, is that a lot of people think that there was no plan because of the way that things were just ripped out so violently. And that is true. I can't deny that th- that things were removed, sometimes even carelessly. But there was a plan. <laughs> it's just that the plan was falling apart as they were, you know, accomplishing it. But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Um, I wanted to show people this map of the original plans for the Museum of the Sea. Because they did plan it out. Oh, and yeah. they had this idea. So this is the whole ship, and you can see everything below E deck was basically going to be this massive museum, and everything above E deck was going to be the hotel and the shopping and dining. But basically, you mean, you mean our deck, right? Our deck, yeah. I mean, it, I mean, that was that was the original plan. Was that everything below our deck? I mean everything below our deck was literally like on the on the scrapping plan yeah and and the fact that anything below our deck still exists today is purely on the fact that they started to realize that they were well over budget Mm -hmm. well so the so the original museum of z was literally gonna take place in all of these these um watertight compartments. Queen Mary had 18 watertight compartments. I think according to this map, just about 17 of those compartments was going to have something to do with the museum. Yeah. And so we can see, um, great. I can't even read this. Um, I'm going to pull up the cruddier version because at least I can read that. Um, so this first section in red was administration. Then next to it in orange was a, Phenomena Theater. No idea what that is. Um, Heritage of the Sea, plus a lobby entrance. Um, Highways of the Sea. Horizons of the Sea was next. 
Then we have the Queen Mary story plus the remaining engine room, which those actually were built. Yeah. Um, you have the aft exit storage and maintenance. You have an auditorium up here, which I have no idea. I think, oh, yeah, okay. That That is where the, the second class pool used to be. And that's something I want to bring up after we're done with this. Okay. And then, yeah, you got snack shops and, yeah, just a bunch of random stuff here, Super administration. Powerful. Yeah. So basically, when people ask, why did they have to rip out every last room? That's why. The, originally, all those spaces were going to be used for this Museum of the Sea. And as Steve said, as work began, the budget, you know, they were running way over budget and things had to be downsized. So even though they cleared out all the rooms, uh, they only, end, only ended up using a few of those large spaces to create the, the right. eventual... And they're, still, and they're still sitting empty today. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But um, what I was going to bring up, and this is what... you Yeah, you mentioned as you were skimming through all the sections on the, the map, but Mark also said in the second class pool, that which other things removed. And I think that's one of the greatest losses from the decks below our deck that were that were removed that was one of the greatest losses of all the things they've taken out was that pool and i mean even though that the glass panels still exist of the fish and the clock one of them is shattered so that's you know that's a, a loss in itself but yeah out of all the things that they could have and they and they could have kept that pool they could have, if they were going to remove everything then they could have at least kept that pool but they didn't yeah, you know, I, 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 again, you know, they were looking at, um, you know, they wanted to have some kind of a represent representation of a pool, so they had the first class pool. Um, mm -hmm. They, you know, they probably thought the second class pool is a surplus thing; it doesn't need to exist anymore. And uh, you know, if if you were to go on, you know, back then with the mindset of what. A lot of us have today in that and you know in the preservation side of things um yeah it would be done completely different but, mm -hmm. but back then it was uh and it's that that's theory. actually standing inside one of the main condensers probably to the forward engine room since they're cutting it completely up but that's <laughs> inside one of the main condensers I I just recently sent a bunch of uh, conversion photos too of inside the ship, but um, one more thing I was gonna say about the pool is I heard that when the workers were told to take sledgehammers and destroy things into the pool, they actually started crying, and they at first they refused to. I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Yeah. It, so every oh god, there's, I mean I I'll, I'll tell you this really quick story. So going back to Pier E, right? So remember I was telling you about all the food and all the dirty dishes and everything? So there was no running water on the ship. Mm. No, no seating. You couldn't. So they hired some people to come on board to help clean the ship because the, the ship was literally stinking of rotting food. Um, be, uh, the food out on, on the counters, on the tables. So now you've got all these dirty dishes. Do you know what happened to most of them? Out hmm. the portholes and into the water. Really? Yeah. yeah. I would. I, I really would like to either be certified as a diver or hire a diver and go over there to Pier E and search the bottom of that that uh, uh, area because there's got to be China. Oh, good, for sure. Good China just sitting there because they they tossed it overboard. How are they? They can't clean it. There's no water. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So that so it's that fun. photograph that photograph there that is uh that's uh wait a minute where is that I think it's boiler room five this is in the um what would now be the uh, uh the exhibit hall you're looking at boiler room five and then into boiler room four yeah because you can see they removed a bulkhead mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um which you know once again I have to reiterate because everybody talks about this even to this day but 
they removed sections of the bulkhead that were safe to remove. I don't want people thinking that, oh, they removed part of the bulkhead, so that's, you know, making the, the top of the ship sink down into the bottom of the ship, and it's causing all kinds of structural issues. This isn't necessarily a huge part of the structural issues of the ship. The ship was actually designed with holes this big so that way they could insert the boilers in the first place when the yep. ship was constructed. That's right. So she's designed to hold up just fine with these huge holes in these bulkheads in these specific ways. I must say it that way in these specific mm -hmm. ways. Um, but yeah, so that being said, it's still hard to see this. It's, you know, hard to look at it cause it's, you know, uh, and even but to, to what? Abel, I was going to say, even to this day, they're still holding up fine. So it's been 50 plus years and yeah. they're, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they did a, they did a sounding of the ship. There's no um, reason to believe that uh, any of the decks have been sinking because of the holes in these bulkheads. There's nothing, you know, yeah. if there's any problems with the decks, it's due to the way the ship was ballasted. <laughs> so Yeah. Well, um, but I just pulled up a photo of them removing uh, they've already removed the aft funnel and are removing the forward funnel. Uh, the middle funnel remains. Now, according to f information I have that specifically states that they removed the forward and aft funnels, you know, in order to access the boiler room spaces to get things pulled out through the the, the funnel hatches. Right. But they specifically say that the third funnel remained. Um I don't believe the third funnel today is original. No. I believe it is also a brand new funnel compared to, you know, well, the original. Didn't they just recently, I think it's the second funnel, didn't they just put like an electrical door onto it or something? Not the app funnel. Oh, so it is the aft. Yeah. So yeah. There's, there's no way that's the original. Yeah. No. But yeah. Um, I, I think it was just a matter of, I think the aft funnel was the one that, uh, uh, was most important to them, but they were working on the forward funnel um, at the same time. So why the middle funnel remained, it kind of looked like an, like a, like Coronia. Yeah. A large Coronia. Yeah. <laughs> Cause here's like another photo. Uh, after they were doing the removal of the funnels, they left the middle funnel. <laughs> and by the way, in that photograph, you can see the collapsed portions of the, of the funnels. On, and on the oxide. I was the mentions. That's one of the biggest misconceptions that people have is that as soon as you know the funnels were so rusted and they were so worn oh. out that as soon as they took them off, they fell apart. And the only thing holding them together was the paint. And that's not true. That's just because the way they were designed was yeah. because they needed to be mm -hmm. held up by the the uh, the lead, the funnel leads. And if they didn't have the support, just similar to the hole, where it's yeah. designed mm -hmm. to have you cradled from all angles and all right. sides. Inside and inside yeah. and out, because you've got the guys, you got the guy wires on the outside that's keeping tension onto the structure of the of the funnel, you know, going down at an angle. But yeah. inside the funnel, you've got a, you've got the, you know, the entire uptake uh, uh, yeah. shafts and the scrubbers and all that that's in there, and then they're braced with with cross members and everything that go from that piece to the to the skin of the funnel. You, well, you remove all that and the funnel itself has no structure to it anymore. And that's, yeah, that just, was the problem that they had. It just collapsed because it's right. nothing yeah. to hold it together. And on top of that, it's also designed to sit in stacks. It's not in layers, the whole stack. It's not designed right. to, the ring's not designed to sit on its own. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah essentially you take, you take away all the inner and outer support and these things are just steel it's, sheets. It's like, like there's, it, yeah. It, it, and so, you can see that they're collapsed onto the dock and stuff. There's also, I'll pull up another photo. There's, there's a story that says that somebody was able to put their finger through the funnel. That's how weak it was. That's not true because the ship wouldn't have even made it to long beach. Yeah. Because after it, that, yeah. that voyage All the weather and wind and yeah, especially around. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, the funnels look bad because they haven't been painted in a long time. They haven't been maintained in a long time. Remember, the ship sat for two years before they yeah. even started working on it. You know, so, yeah, no wonder why the funnels look in this shape. Um, yeah, but uh, other than that, the funnels were in good shape. But the reason why they chose to put uh, stainless steel funnels on the ship 
was really more to do with the future maintenance of the ship. You know, they wanted something that wouldn't rust away, something that could withstand the 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 weather and stuff like that. Because remember, these funnels are not money earners for the ship. They don't have any kind of financial return value to them. So yeah. if you can make them out of something that will last for as long as possible, then that would be very beneficial to the building because the ship was designated as a building. So um, that is why they replaced the funnels instead of just reconstructing them and putting them back on the ship. Well, Today, um, if the if Queen Mary had undergone this, they probably would have tried to salvage yeah. the funnels. Well, I was going to say it was also because of probably the financial issues they were having anyways. So they just went with the cheapest option that was going to save them the most money in the future, like you said. And and, and, I'll, and I'll, to touch base on that a little bit, I mean, first off, this was... Uh, all of this information was starting to leak out to the public as far as the the expense that was happening. You know, they bought the ship for three, almost three and a half million. They had expected about a uh, like a fifteen to twenty million dollar budget for, for everything. The you know to build the port at Pier J, to do the, the conversion work on the ship, and by the time it was done, it was nearly one hundred million dollars. Yeah, by nineteen seventy one. And it was getting to a point to where, uh, and th that wasn't complete. That wasn't with all of their plans. They had to stop most of their plans that they had um, because they couldn't afford it. They could they couldn't add to that that huge you know red you know figure line of a budget. And then they started pointing blame as to why the ship was becoming over budget, and. And that's a whole other sad story, but unfortunately, it it led to the suicide of the uh, retired naval officer who was basically in charge of the ship, and that was Admiral Fee. And mm -hmm. and and unfortunately, he he committed suicide because they had started to lay the blame on him. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, um, yeah, it is a sad story. Alex. Um, did you get the picture that I put into the thing of all the interior conversion? Oh, uh, yeah, I'll show that. Um, well, let me show this photo first. Um, this is of the ship at Pier E, and you can see that they have everything piled up on the dock. Um, so that, just that like... big cylindrical item that's right there, that's one of the main condenser pumps from the forward engine room. Those same pumps are in the aft engine room today, but... That's one of the main condenser pumps. Mm -hmm. And then over here, it's hard to see, but over here are sections of the propeller shafts. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's some of that there. Mm -hmm. And then, um, in fact, I think this corner piece here is the dark piece is part of the condenser. I think so. I think you're right. I think you might be right. It could it could be that, or it could be one of the. Um, the gears well those are those are the uh, turbine beds there that one shot where you can see the the um the guy that's on with the acetylene torch he's on one of the beds of the uh turbines in the yeah. board oh room. yeah i was gonna show that one too um i got that one here it's the one that i i call like the the america shot because <laughs> because in the background is this big american flag and he's, it's just like america you know but <laughs> But it's it's so funny because this photo was taken almost as if that was the whole goal was be like, yeah, look at, you know, industrial power and whatever the human power. And but then at the same time, it's like the guy's standing over the remains of a beloved ocean liner, you know, so yeah, yeah. it's just like mm -hmm. so backwards. But yeah, so that's the photo that Steve was talking about of the worker with the acetylene torch. Um, and then I'll get to the photos that, uh, oh, but here's one, one more on taken on the dock and you can see parts of the gears, uh, of the forward engine room. So on the bottom left corner is one of the turbine attached. So I don't know what to call it, but it's the gear that is directly attached to one of the turbines. Cause you can tell, cause it's small. If this was the actual reduction gear, it would have been 14 feet in diameter. And I'm sure it's lying around in here somewhere. Um, yeah. But um, and then there's another section of propeller shaft right there. Yeah. And 
pieces of just pieces everywhere, just huge pieces of stuff. But now we'll mm. get to the ones that Shiloh sent. So let me go ahead and bring this thing down. And um, oh, okay. So this first photo, you can see a worker with an acetylene torch. It appears that that might be the bottom of a boiler, or it could be like it could be like the bottom of like one of the turbines because it looks like the footing that a piece of machinery sits on and they did cut a lot of the footings out not entirely but, <laughs> but uh, uh, some... so that little gear you were talking about because it's now just showing up on my end here that's a that's mm. a pinion gear that that would be one of the gears from one of the turbines yeah and and they all attached they all are you know set to the main gear in the in the gearbox yeah and then, so that was the acetylene torch photo, by the way, that I had on there. And then yeah. here's another one. Uh, I can't tell what room that they're in. But there's a group of, of guys, one of them with an acetylene torch. He's cutting something up. Looks On like, the ceiling? On, on the overhead? No, he's, he's on the floor, on the tank top somewhere. Yeah. Okay, so but, the yeah. one the one where there's like an angled bed that that's one of the beds of the turbines. Um, no, we we already yeah. But I'm 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 waiting for the delay to come up. It's, it's a large room, or now it is at least. Yeah. Let's see the next. But we do have to up. get this thing moving along because we are running on time, but. There's so that other... that that does look like one of the boiler rooms because I think that's that's one of the boilers off to the right side of the column there. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was thinking that. Yeah. And the next photo I don't even know. Cool. There looks like they're cutting parts of the propeller shafts off. Well, it's kind of ah uh... Yeah, I mean, it looks like the bulkhead, and that's where the propeller shaft would go through. Yeah, and yeah. then there, there, that must have been one of the beds of the turbines that they're coming yeah. up. And then beneath that uh, is a photo of uh, they're cutting something from the overhead. I think Steve was about to talk about that one. Right. So, so that that photograph is C deck. That is part of the main cold storage areas on C deck aft, and uh, because. C deck basically doesn't exist today mm -hmm. on the aft port from a, but almost midships aft C deck doesn't exist. And right where, when you come into the, the D deck gangway today into the engine room exhibit, you know, area, um, right above your head, when you come on board would be C deck and above uh, on C deck, there was mainly all the cold storage, you know, the refrigerators, the freezers for, you know, for everything. And so that's part of the the bulkhead structures inside the cold storage area. Yeah. So okay, that was the last one. Um and what was I gonna oh I had a special photo for you guys only because I know somebody was talking about it the other day and I'm like, why not? I got the photo, you know? Um <laughs> if I can find it here. Oh, great. Now my file folder is, like, acting up. Oh, here we go. This is a really cruddy photo. But, um, Steve, I'm showing the photo of the removed second-class pool. And in this photo, you can kind of see... So, you can see three different decks. And at the very bottom, along the 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 remaining deck on the bottom, which I think is... Let's see that would be E that would be F. So at the bottom of F deck you can see a a square hole cut in the floor. That was for like the drainage pipes and stuff of the pool. Mm -hmm. And then the pool tank would have sat somewhere on F deck and then the the middle deck in this photo was E deck where you would have had the pool room and then on either sides of these pillars there would have been like a gymnasium for the second class and stuff like that. And the dressing rooms. The dressing rooms, yeah, all that stuff. 
And, um, and the reason why I bring this up is because, um, I was asked a couple days back, like, can you still see the footprint of the second class pool? The pool, no. The room, yes, because they cut the entire room out. So that includes the walkways that were around the pool. Mm -hmm. But basically, this shows the second class pool room completely cut out, as well as the the floor above it, because there was right. a, there was stuff above it. And what they did was, you know, you can't cut all this all this stuff out and then just leave it. You you need to support the decks above. So they installed these really tall steel girders and then running across them are double girders that mm. are four feet tall each. And honestly, they could probably with just one girder going across, it could support the weight needed, but they put two for redundancy. So a lot of people say like, Oh, you know, the, you know, when they, when they cut out these huge rooms and extra decks on the ship, everything above it is sagging down, which is causing more issues. That's not true no. because they put so much redundancy of strength into mm. the steel work that they added back in to support the areas above. There's a crow who's trying to be on. My, I hear it. My show. <laughs> um, uh, so, I mean, when, when they were initially building the those that whole app section of you know D deck uh and below um uh, we're actually basically from R deck down uh the initial designs were thought to be okay until um the engineering firm that they had brought in said no it needs to be uh, reinforced so they brought in heavier i beams um for uh, columns and for uh, for girders, and so you look at it today, and it it's extremely overbuilt. Yeah, which yes. which was another reason why the the budget went up, and it continued to go up, and and so they dumped a lot of money into the aft portion of the ship, and that's the reason why today, as you as if you're aft, everything's gone. Almost mm -hmm. to midships, everything is gone. But as you start to work forward from midships to the bow, things aren't gone. They're partially gone, or maybe mostly gone. But as you work, as you continue to work forward, um, you will find still sections of crew room areas. There's still sections of uh, of uh, the you know the mail sorting rooms. Everything that's forward. Is almost left completely oh, intact. Even the specie room that we covered a few days the ago. The specie room, right? Exactly. That's a that's a good, good example. That whole area that was a mail sorting area, and, and then the specie room, which uh, mm -hmm. which was where they you know they they kept the the gold when she needed to transfer gold to the United States or back and forth. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, that's that that is virtually untouched. That area. It's there's nothing. But uh, the the reason that is though is because they did over engineer, and they ran well, out of well money. because they, yeah because they ran out of money. Um, yeah. In fact, and in fact, if you look at um, the the beds, the the tank tops, like starting from boiler room five, if you look at boiler room five, boiler room five, they cut flush all of the. Um, the bed supports for the boilers clean yeah. to the clean to the deck. You can't hardly see anything left of, of where the boilers were mounted. Mm -hmm. As you start to work forward, you go into boiler room four, boiler room three, boiler room two. You not only start to see the mounts on the tank tops for the boilers, but they were getting so sloppy and and weren't doing as great of a job. There's actually portions of boiler, you know. Uh, Attached to the uh, the mounts on the on the tank top. Yeah, yeah, and they just cut over it. Yep. Yep. Oh yeah, and then the picture that Alex put up here is part of that stern section because that's this is the very stern in this photo. You can see yeah. the curve. So that little box there on the bottom deck, that's D deck, and that's the steering that's the steering room skylight that would have continued all the way up because you can see there's light coming down from the above area. That's this that's the skylight looking down. 
and that balcony portion that you see on either side that goes all the way around to the stern that's what remains of sea deck and that's basically how it is today this is what's known as the gallery um area of the engine room exhibit which is always closed yeah yeah um i was trying to uh here's i have like one th <laughs> found just one but somebody was just asking about the furniture when did they remove all the furniture from the ship A around the same time technically mm -hmm. i mean they the they wanted to use the various public rooms on the ship for you know banquets and dining halls and all that kind of stuff and it's easier to maintain and clean um what are the, what they call um uh banqueting chairs and tables those are much easier because you buy them in bulk and you know they're they're easy to clean easy to maintain Boy. these furniture pieces piled up i mean these might not all be originals but the ones that are originals they are a lot harder to maintain because they're more valuable they require more attention all that kind of stuff um and with the banqueting uh, furniture and chairs in particular is that they're easy to stack. They can store them much easier. Yeah. So so I will tell you right now, looking at that photograph, I don't see any original furniture in there. Yeah, they just look like old hotel. Yeah. Furniture. Yeah. I I have photos of the cargo holds somewhere, but I can't find them. But uh, to go back to the question about when did they start removing the furniture, that's probably the first thing that started happening. In fact, there are photographs. I should have probably brought that up. There's photographs of promenade deck where it was like a staging area where they started bringing out all the chairs from um, like the cabins, um, you know, just just regular sitting chairs for cabins. Um, and and uh, oh, shoot, the vanity, the, the vanity uh, uh, benches, you yeah. know, all the little vanity benches, all that stuff. They started stacking them into promenade deck. Uh, so that they could take them off the ship. What they they first did was they built an actual building on Pier E to temporarily store the furniture. Well, that was uh, not enough space. So they actually started using like aircraft hangers at Long Beach Airport. And they were basically looking at, you know, we're going to sell it. It's, it's all going to go for sale. And they... They did have it wasn't auction. It was basically you know come down to our warehouse and and uh, you know buy a piece of the Queen Mary. And in fact, my grandmother bought you know china and blankets and and other stuff. It was just basically like a, a big sale. You know, come down to the warehouse, and that was what they did. And then um, what was it? Stores of the Queens took some of the a lot of the furniture actually, not even just the furniture, just various things: the Bakelite, Royno handles, the the water jugs, the ashtrays, even the keys, like the one I have, they just started selling all those things off before the hotel even was remotely close to being opened. And then once the hotel did open, they sold the remaining things they had. Um, like the ashtray I have with the little sticker on the bottom that they marketed as being on the last great cruise, you know, it has the Long Beach emblem on it. And that's, yeah, they started selling yeah. their own the furniture and pieces in the gift shops yeah. until they ran out of the things. That's why there's so few of those things left because they sold a lot of them. And, and believe it or not, they, they kept a lot of stuff. Um, yeah. uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of the Roanoid white uh, thermos jugs. There yeah. were hundreds and hundreds of the really nice wood veneered um, uh, waste baskets, you know, that were in cabins. And, those items actually were still on board in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Disney w still had the original waste baskets in the cabins. Still were using the thermos jugs in the cabins. And they started disappearing. Oh, of course, yeah. Well, so to the um the porthole screws. Oh, yeah, the, the yeah, the big nuts to to uh, yeah. screw the the uh, porthole into place, yeah. Yeah, those started getting lost. Yep. I've seen yeah. some for sale on eBay, too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, I think 
that's as much of the conversion as we can really cover. Cause I mean, otherwise we'd just be here forever and we're already <laughs> over on time. So um, yeah, I mean, good grief. I mean, we could just go on forever <laughs> about this stuff. If, if you could show one last picture, if you have it, do you have that one of the a deck uh, foyer where the purser's desk is and they have those lights hung up because it's like all the conversion photos we've shown oh. so far are the engine spaces. We haven't really showed any public space conversion photos okay hold on uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you have it at the moment but there's another one too of the the main lounge where they're ripping up the uh, flooring oh there's one of the pool too where the um where all of the uh the, the turkish baths are all taken out yeah those i think there's another one too of the what? The, the second class pool you do have what? to get like i have to get going but um okay so here is the one that uh, Shiloh was talking about from a deck. Um, they had to hang up uh, string up lights because as you know, the none of the boilers and stuff were running. A lot of them were being removed at that time. Um, so there was nothing to power the ship with lights. So they had to string up a bunch of construction lights uh, throughout the ship. So that way they could see what they were doing, but you can see that, uh, it still looks like the Queen Mary, you know? It's just, gosh. Boarded up and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the things they had also done was they had painted all of the uh, the outside um, windows black with, with, with black paint. So you didn't have natural light coming through yeah. because they wanted to protect what was inside the ship. You know, good thinking on their part of uh, damage from ultraviolet light. Mm -hmm. Wow. But but the windows when it when the ship opened as a hotel, they, they were never covered in any kind of like ultraviolet filtering film, right? No, so it's like, no. It's almost they like weren't. what was the point? Because then they just remove all the paint and then for 56 years i know and, and and they were they were protecting all the all the area rugs and the furniture that they ended up selling anyway so i don't yeah. know what the point was in the first place <laughs> yeah oh goodness but yeah i do have to get going because i'm definitely 30 minutes over the amount of well work. you're just 40, a big 42 minutes you're just the a big party pooper <laughs> i i am you know i run a tight ship here <laughs> 42 minutes over, but still. <laughs> so anyway, folks, that is the story of Queen Mary on her last great cruise, arriving in Long Beach, and then the conversion process, you know, to um, to becoming a hotel and museum. And, you know, I must reiterate, as, as upsetting as it is to see all these photos and stuff of the conversion process and see the chaos that ensued, you know, this was the first time any ocean liner had been made into a uh, hotel and museum. There were, there was no, you know, set of like, the, what am I trying to say? There was no formula to follow. Nobody knew what people would eventually be interested in when boarding a museum ship, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was just like, they did what they thought would be the best idea. And they found out they were wrong. <laughs> so, took them 50 some odd years to learn how to do things right. But, well, they're, uh, and they're still learning. Really? Still they learning. are still learning. Yes. They're like so, children. <laughs> yeah. And you know, but there's a lot of new and exciting things happening for the ship and there's going to be a lot of new restoration projects underway soon. And, um, you know, there's just, there's a bright future ahead of the Queen Mary, especially now that there's no third party companies that are in charge of her that are just yeah. looking to make a quick buck, you know? So there's just, there's a lot of hope in the future. And that's one of the things I wanted to leave everybody with because I can't tell you how many times you go on Facebook, you talk to all these people and they're just, they are salty from the 50 some odd years that the ship has faced in long beach. Yeah. And it's hard to get them to be excited again about something that very clearly is a good thing, you know? So 
yeah, I just wanted to leave you guys with that. Yeah, so everybody comes to my channel to get some positive news as opposed to just. Yeah, we're we're in uncharted ground because really, you know, we're now in a in a world where preservation is is very much appreciated and, and the history is very much appreciated. And now we have the city in complete control of the ship. Whereas over the last 40 years, she had been under a master lease with another company who didn't see, you know, the same way as the city. And the city didn't have the choice of doing what they wanted to do. Now they do. And I think that, uh, I think with a little guidance from all of us, you know, just not, you know, you, me, Steamship Historical Society, Queen Mary, you know, QMI, I, I think th they're listening. Mm -hmm. They are listening. I get emails from the general manager that I, I would have never gotten emails from the general manager of the ship, you know, before. before yeah. Yeah. Urban Commons, yeah. forget it. Absolutely wouldn't even talk to me. Yeah. I've emailed the general manager and already at least one of the things that I've listed yeah. <laughs> has already yeah. been implemented. So, yeah. And even you know, when, I so they... on, when I was on board and I ran into him, he, he, he'll, he'll stop by and talk to you if he wants to. Well, not even if he wants to. He just he just does it. He just, just you know he'll be in the middle of something. He'll stop right what he's doing yeah. and he'll talk to you right then and there. And that's yeah. I I don't think I even saw the any managing staff when I was there when Urban Commons was running the ship. I don't remember seeing anybody, but he's yeah. out walking the ship all the time. I heard he's even there on his off days. Oh yeah, he he's there on the yeah. weekends with his wife. Yeah, a lot of times <laughs> with his family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great a good guy. sign. Absolutely great yeah. guy. Steve Coloca. Great guy. Yep. So, yeah, there's lots of hope for the future, you guys. So always keep that with you. You know, I don't want you guys to walk away from this and be like, oh, what a sad story. What a tragic ending to the Queen Mary, because this is not an ending. No. Man, I so think, I think the biggest thing to take away from this is that, that we could not have a Queen Mary at all, but we still do. Even with all the things that have happened to her, she still exists, and we should still preserve of what's left of her. Mm -hmm. Yep. I agree. All right, folks. Um, well, time to say goodbye, unfortunately. We have so much fun talking about this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but there will be new um, announcements coming uh, towards the end of the year, which we are approaching the end of the year right now. Yeah. Um, for some new and exciting things, new ways that you can learn about the Queen Mary and new ways that you can talk about the Queen Mary. So I got some exciting stuff coming up for you guys, and I think you guys will love it. Um, but for now, that's it. And I want to thank you all for joining me. I want to thank Shiloh and Steve for coming on to the show as co-hosts and, you know, lending their knowledge, their photos all that kind of stuff to all this. So thank you, you guys. Have fun. I always having yeah. fun with this. I mean, yeah. every time we do one of these, we go over the time limit. So yeah. maybe, a, maybe a part three, <laughs> maybe a part three. Maybe, yeah, maybe part three. <laughs> no, don't listen to him. <laughs> no, but we do got to do another live stream of something. Oh yeah. yeah. That'd be, yeah. So maybe we'll do, maybe we'll do one of the long beach years. Who knows? That was <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> all right folks thanks for watching and i'll see you all next time bye-bye merry everybody. christmas everybody merry christmas merry christmas <laughs>